Hello and welcome. You're watching ET Now. I'm Anisha Jain. We are in conversation with the top management of JSW Energy to try and decode what's the way forward and what's the utilization of the QIP proceeds that they've just managed to garner. I have with me Mr. Sharad Mahindra, the joint MD and CEO, as well as Pratesh Vinay, the Director of Finance and CFO, joining us on the show. Thank you, gentlemen, for speaking with ET Now and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us here. Absolutely. But let me start with you, Sharad. It's been a couple of months that you have come in at the helm of JSW Energy. How's been the uh, you know, experience so far? And more importantly, what are your focus areas for yourself and the company for the medium term? Yes, uh, it is now a few months when uh, I am here. I think the focus area, what you ask for, is uh, to uh, continue the way we have been executing uh, our project, building the capacities and the capabilities at the same time to get future ready also in terms of deliverables whether it is related to people whether it is related to the skill set and talent and also in terms of uh, the effective and cost effective execution of the ongoing projects mm. to understand what we have earlier said our uh, strategy 2.0 of reaching 20 gigawatt by FY30 to ensure that uh, we are well ahead of time we achieve that number looks like we're likely to achieve that ahead yes. of time yes definitely because if you uh, remember when we uh, announced 20 gigawatt by fy30 it was in two phases correct the phase one was to reach 10 gigawatt by fy25 the fiscal which has just started and the previous year we have uh, just ended at 7.2 gigawatt and with the amount of work which is already in progress we are quite confident that we will be reaching or slightly uh, exceeding the 10 gigawatt number by FY20. And then in phase 2, we had said to add another 10 gigawatt by FY20. Hmm. But uh, seeing the way the India as an economy has been uh, performing, uh, entire world is looking towards India. And the way the power demand uh, driven by the manufacturing growth, the rate of urbanization and the infra push, uh, which is which we are seeing the growth. Uh, we are quite confident that uh, the our uh, uh, target of reaching 20 gigawatt by FY20 will be accelerated and we are quite confident that we will be achieving that number few years earlier only and this QIP raise is definitely going to be a major enabler uh, for us to uh, accelerate this growth. Okay, so not just FY30, but even before that, that's the target. And maybe shortly we'll be talking about strategy 3.0 as well, the pace that you guys are growing. But let me get Pratesh also in the conversation, QIP, that has been the latest event, right? And it was a large QIP at 5,000 crore, got a large amount of subscription as well. But help us understand the need of it. Uh, are you looking at just repaying the debt? Because debt was pretty comfortable for you. So what was the need of probably making this large QIP at this point of time? So, uh, you're right. I mean, to put this into context, uh, let's keep the fundraise aside. Mm. What was our spending capacity? Let's, let's first try and decode that, right? On an average, we are generating free cash of between three to three and a half thousand crores. You can lever that three is to one. So, we have a spending power of between 12 to 15,000 crores every year. You know, this was a guidance that we had been consistently talking about for the last few quarters of the annual CAPEX plan, right? Now, what this additional 5,000 crores does is that it gives me an additional 20,000 crore spending power as a one-time over and above the 12 to 15,000 crore recurring, which will be increasing progressively as the new projects get commissioned, the free cash generation will be inching up, right? So, uh, the issue is why, to, mm -hmm. to, to come specifically to your question, I think there were two primary reasons to do this. One was to, of course, build the war chest. Sharad has already talked about that the opportunity set has increased. I mean, to put things into context, uh, in the last two fiscal years, meaning fiscal 2022 and fiscal 2023 combined, mm. the annual amount of tendering for RE capacity that happened for two years combined was about 20 gigawatt. Mm. The year that just ended in March 24, the annual amount of tendering that happened was 50 gigawatt. So what got tendered in two cumulative years of 22 and 23, two and a half times of that got tendered in this year alone. And going forward, every year, MNRE is saying they will do 50 gigawatt of tendering. So one is the opportunity set from an organic demand growth is much higher, right? Hence the room to accelerate growth that Sharad was talking about. Over and above organic growth, 
a lot of inorganic opportunities are also there. You know, you would recall we acquired a large platform last year, 1.75 gigawatt of Mitra. Right now, as we are speaking, there is between 10 to 15 gigawatt of various RE platforms backed by financial sponsors, which are either already running a process or about to launch a process because the fund lives of the principal sponsors are coming to an end. So looking at the opportunity set, both organic and inorganic, yes, there is a room to accelerate growth. This was one opportunity. Mm. The second reason was this, that, you know, in our extensive engagement with institutional investors in the last year or so, we've seen a lot of feedback that, look, you know, you guys are doing an amazing job. JSW is a clear outlier in terms of execution efficiency, but you have a very low free float mm. and hence liquidity is not there. So the strategic intent was also to create a liquidity event to get some very high quality blue chip global investors in the cap table who can be your long term partners for success. So these were the two primary objectives. But if the, there was so much interest, why uh, price the QRP so attractively? Uh, it was done at what, 485 bucks a piece right. while the current market price is 600? Explain me the rationale there. So, very good question. You know, I am yet to see a data, but it is very rare to see the stock price going up by 20% after the QIP book is launched. And after the, such a large QIP with 6-7% dilution. Exactly, because the pricing was done ref with reference to the SEBI flow price, which was determined as of last Monday, right, which was 510 rupees. On that day, the closing price was about 520, 525 thereabouts, if I'm not wrong. So, it was not a very wide discount with respect to the flow price and the spot price. But the fact that the stock has gone up by almost 20% since then is making it look much more. The second thing uh, is this, that if you look at JSW's track record of, you know, doing primary capital raise, we've always left some money on the table for investors to also be happy, you know, so that it should be a win-win for everyone. Mm. So to attract very large quality good names and, you know, to get this kind of a response was also driven by the fact of where it was priced, you know, so... Okay, so attractively priced, yes. And this what Pritesh is saying, like we all know that it is 3.2x. Subscribe. Uh, subscri over subscription was there. And a uh, lot of investors who have got to uh, primary have also gone into the secondary. Yeah. Uh, they were not, which clearly shows their confidence also uh, on uh, our the company's uh, uh, profile and uh, the execution and the deliverables. Mm -hmm. So that also shows the confidence, which gives us also a lot of confidence. Yeah, totally, because now you have uh, your neck on the line. A lot of people are depending on you further. So, of course, that adds to the pressure, but it's a good pressure to get, right? The JSW Group also has aspirations for electric vehicles, right? That's been yeah. uh, talked about. What kind of role JSW Energy will play in it? Yeah. See, uh, a very good question. We have been discussing on this. See, with our group company entering into the EV space, I think again there also the mm. one of the major cost is the battery storage. Correct. So uh, as we have already announced that we will be going, we are looking uh, uh, maybe finalizing a technology partner to set up a battery storage uh, plant mm -hmm. uh, for the requirement in the EV space as well as in the battery energy storage space also for us, okay. for the from for the from the power point of view. So we are already uh, working on in setting up a 10 gigawatt hour uh, capacity mm. uh, in India for our own captive requirements and if the opportunity comes even in the marketplace also. Okay. So we are actively evaluating, actively evaluating that. Yeah, because it looks like if things go this way, there would be huge opportunity from external players as well. So that's really interesting. But I just wanted to come back to the point of QIP, Pratesh. Why not divest perhaps that neo level? Because that too was talked about at some point of time and there's huge amount of interest at the renewable level as well. Why not look at unlocking value there versus the holding company? So, uh, you know, if you recall what we have consistently been articulating to the markets, uh, you know, in the last one year or so, we've got this question many times. Yeah. Uh, from different types of stakeholders and we've consistently maintained that look whatever we will do at a certain point of time will be the option that is a most value accretive firm a shareholders point of view. So you know in preparation of that two years ago we rejected our corporate holding structure created this vehicle NEO and it was a monetization opportunity which still exists by the way right but the issue is this that you know for the re other reason that I mentioned that how do you get large global blue chip you know, investors into your cap table, you know, so that was also an important consideration. So 
JSW Neo continues to be a hundred percent sub of uh, JSW Steel, uh, sorry JSW Energy, and uh, and you know uh, in future who knows uh, a few years down the line if there's an option to monetize there, we will actively look at that. But from a capital point of view, what we needed in the here and now is already solved for. Uh, and hence, I would say that that question is a bit premature at this is point. Is it only here and now or at least next three to five years or are you going to perhaps go to the market again? What do you think? No, it will depend on the size of the opportunity, right? I mean, the idea is not to have a negative carry by just keeping a large cash Sunday. chest uh, idle on the books, right? So the deployment opportunities have to be there. I think it is reasonable to expect that with such a large capital raise at least for the next couple of years or so yeah. uh, we are sorted, yeah, sorted right yeah. but, but he did hint that there is perhaps some inorganic growth opportunities as well actively considering some that we can probably hear about in recent times or what would be the scale and size of which medium are you looking at some hints there uh, see uh, we actually uh, not to name any this is a continuous process a lot of sure. platforms lot of opportunities are there in the market space uh, we keep evaluating uh, for uh, and worry on, on various parameters. Ultimately, it depends on the value mm. and uh, what returns I am getting. Because we under we and we don't compare with a standard uh, project cost of building a greenfield. Because we uh, have our strength of executing the project fast, True. executing at the best uh, one of the lowest cost uh, project execution. We benchmark ourselves with that and then compare the opportunities. Mm. But definitely, as we, we uh, as we had acquired Maitra. A year and a half back, which was a which was a good uh, asset to acquire, uh, which enabled us to even build the capability also. Because sure. we had, as you said some time back, we entered into this space, so that has really helped us in uh, fastening our process of uh, having the right skill set required in this space. So we keep evaluating, and we will keep evaluating. Depends on the value and the returns, because it has its own advantages also. If a running asset, I am getting, I start getting the. Uh, cash immediately from those assets, so that is a inherent advantage of the, any such as acquisition. Mm. So we are evaluating, and as and when any opportunity looks attractive, we'll definitely be keen. And this QIP raise fund raise will definitely, as further strengthen our resolve to look for these. I like the focus on uh, the value and returns that you're talking about, but your shareholders do have expectation of value and returns, and they have like exceeded now because you've delivered time and again. Uh, tell us, Pratish, what would be your message to them? Because in terms of your net debt, it had gone up a bit, 26,000 odd crores because of the aggressive expansion that you're talking about. But there were those aspirations in terms of keeping the net debt to a bit, uh, you know, limited. Uh, there were expectations in terms of how you're looking at expanding your OCs, etc. as well. Talk to us about what investors should watch out for next. Yeah, no, that, I think that's a very important question you've asked, uh, you know, and very timely as well. Uh, look, there are three moats that JSW Energy has compared to any other player in the industry. Lowest capex per megawatt, lowest o &M cost per megawatt, one of the strongest balance sheet because of which one of the highest credit ratings in the private sector and hence one of the most competitive financing cost for any of our ongoing projects. So from a strategic architecture point of view, anything that we want to do, we would want to retain these three modes at all points of time. So what is important to understand is this, that you know, from a rating agency point of view, what are the guardrails mm. to protect our credit ratings, right? And the guardrails by the rating agencies are very clear, that they talk about a sustainable normalized net debt to EBITDA of up to 5.5 times, right? Mm. So as long as, because in large uh, capital intensive infrastructure projects, where you do a three is to one debt to equity, and you have a 25 year offtake, uh, when you solve for a certain debt service coverage ratio, mm. it translates to a net debt to EBITDA of between 5.25 to 5.5 times, right? So that's what the rating agencies say. So you're right, even before this, at a 4.6 times headline, but the underlying TTM was only 3.2 times. So we had a strong headroom, you know? So the idea is this, that don't push yourself to the limits. Mm. We are a very conservative company. All our capital allocation track record in the last two and a half decades goes on to, you know, demonstrate that repeatedly across cycles. For a decade, we didn't grow because there was no visibility of returns. And when the visibility of returns changes, we don't shy away from changing the growth gears. So the only message that we will want to leave with the shareholders is this, that you can continue to expect no change in strategy when it comes to capital allocation decision. 
you can expect no change in the hurdle rates of re underlying returns when a project selection whether organic or inorganic is happening and we will continue to retain the best in class balance sheet at all point of time. I like the high conviction that you guys are talking with clarity in terms of what you are looking at. But Asharat, in terms of the growth aspirations that the company has, talk to me specifically about, uh, you know, a couple of areas like uh, the hydrogen part of it, plus what's happening to the renewable part of it as well. How are you looking at growing that? Further, what is the roadmap which is available in terms of growth? And uh, what do you think is going to be the need from India point of view? Because we're talking about Vixit Bharat by 2047. You're already seeing power demand in double digits almost. Uh, how do you think uh, India should actually look at bridging the supply-demand gap? Because right now it's just getting larger. Yeah. Uh, see, Asia, very, very uh, valid, most important. This is basically the fundamental base Correct. question on which the entire industry is set up. Is to be built. Correct. We see, when we compare, we see that FY23 number, the peak demand was 203 gigawatt hmm. in the country, which now in the current year, coming summer, it has been already said, is expected to reach 260 gigawatt. Correct. Uh. And uh, this by FY30, or by 32, it is expected to reach 335 gigawatt. That was already uh, the numbers. Now, all these, the way the demand growth is happening in the country, earlier demand growth, uh, if you see, was majorly fed by thermal. Hmm. But now, if additional, even if 15 gigawatt or 20 gigawatt of incremental demand in energy terms is required every year, which means from gre uh, green space for energy point of view, maybe a capacity addition of anything between 40 to 50 gigawatt every year. That is the requirement, which means next eight years, the investment every year in the range of 30 to 35 billion dollars investment is required for this. This is the opportunity. And as uh, uh, demonstrated in the year which has just ended, that uh, country came up uh, the bi renewable bids mm. between 40 to 50 gigawatt of uh, bids which came uh, clearly demonstrates the company's uh, country's goal of reaching 555 gigawatt uh, renewable by, by 30. So I think this has to happen. Uh, there is uh, no uh, element of doubt that mm -hmm. this is not going to happen. But yes, now within this when we say the opportunities which are there, so we are geared up. Yeah. In last 60 days only we started participating in the competitive bid space. Otherwise, we had been focusing for the captive requirements and last 60 days we have won bids equivalent to 3.7 gigawatt, which has taken us our order book in excess of 6.5 gigawatt, including captive and competitive bids. So this is the or confirmed order book which we have to execute. So keeping these things in mind, and this is a very conducive environment also, uh, which is attractive rates, uh, uh, prices are being discovered which are reasonable from the buyer's point of view mm. also. Now, going forward, the requirement is just plain wind or plain solar is not going to be uh, alone sufficient for the buyers. Mm. They are looking for round-the-clock green power or maybe FDRE, which is fixed dis uh, dispatchable renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Because every state <clears throat> has a different hourly pat consumption pattern. So, they want a storage. So, we, the, we participated in a bid about uh, 30 days back, 45 days back. We have won that bid also of providing a FDRE solution, which is a mix of hybrid, hmm. uh, means wind, solar and battery storage. So uh, we have to design for each and every state in a different way. Every state has a different usage pattern, which is agriculture dominated state will have a different usage pattern. Uh, manufacturing driven like Maharashtra and other, other states will have uh, a different uh, usage pattern. So we are working on green hydrogen is again the need which is going to be there. As a, but uh, yes, it is, I will say from economics point of view, it is, is still slightly away because 70% of the power, uh, the power cost is 70% of the total cost of green hydrogen. So, but yes, from learning point of view, as I said, mm. that we are working on that. So, moving ahead, battery storage, pump storage, uh, green hydrogen, uh, along with wind and solar is the future on which we are working in all possible combinations and individually also.
But Sharad, what about uh, the way forward? And I, I, I want to drill down further on the growth drivers because, of course, your mainstay continues to be thermal and generation, but renewable has become a large part of the business as well. You're looking at getting into this new energy transition as well with the green hydrogen setup being there, with pump storage coming in as well, and a lot more technologies that you're working in. Naysayers are worried that you're spreading yourself too thin. What would you say to that? If you see uh, today, hmm. uh, when we have ended the year at uh, 7.2 gigawatt capacity almost, my portfolio is 50-50. 50 is thermal mm. and 50 is uh, renewable including the large hydro. And uh, the work which is in progress, and as, we, as I said earlier, that by the end of the current fiscal, we will be crossing 10 gigawatt. Uh, this ratio will be uh, in excess of 60% will be renewable. Right, so thermal is reducing. And the, in terms of de-risking ourselves from spreading, as you said, too thin, we don't consider. Because yes, the opportunities are evolving very fast. Uh, initially, it was solar, then wind came, then hybrid, Correct. solar wind hybrid came, then RTC green, now FDRE, then pump storage, battery storage, green hydrogen, lot many things. We have lined up mm -hmm. because we see a lot of synergy in the, all these opportunities. It is not that on day one, everything is going to happen. There is a right time for each. Mm. So presently our focus is setting up uh, the solar capacities and wind capacities. Along with that, uh, the hybrid model mm. and the FDRE, which is a form dispatchable uh, renewable yep. energy, which has now started becoming uh, uh, area of focus by almost all discoms and states. Mm. And there was a recent bid where we won a significant portion of the FDRE bid also about uh, 45 days back, uh, which is a very, very... I will say, uh, technically, uh, we have to be very, very particular in terms of deciding on what the right mix mm. at the best price for the DISCOM also. So our team dedicatedly is working on uh, these options to provide the best solution at best price. Mm. Apart from that, uh, storage when we come, uh, pump storage definitely, yes, which many say is water battery also, yeah. is like uh, uh, the uh, electric st uh, this battery storage. Uh, this is also going to play a very, very big role. Huge opportunities are there. We have signed MOUs at, uh, with uh, many states on this. Mm -hmm. Our team has been doing the work. Pre-project activity in this is quite time consuming which takes one and a half to two years. Oh. We are at a very advanced stage of that period. So pump storage is maybe five years ahead or six years ahead from today. But battery storage, which we won uh, maybe countries uh, largest or maybe one of the largest in the world, one gigawatt hour of battery storage uh, bid what, what we won uh, about a year back. Now we are starting the work on ground. Uh, the battery prices have moderated mm. significantly. And going forward also we see that uh, battery prices are going to be uh, lower. Mm. So which makes this option also uh, very attractive. And also from the need point of view also uh, from the discoms and the states. Mm. This is going to play a very uh, important role for, for two reasons. Hmm. One is that the peak hour demand when we see, which is maybe reaching 9 rupees, 10 rupees. Yeah. What, so th this gives the flexibility whether morning peak or evening peak what they want, oh. which replaces the high cost power with this. And second is the grid stability is also going to uh, be very, very important, with especially with pump storage and uh, uh, the battery storage. It gives hmm. the flexibility. Uh, at what time uh, this uh, power is to be uh, pumped in the grid. Mm. So I think uh, also going into the manufacturing part is that uh, we have signed a technology license with one of the leading wind turbine manufacturers in China, Sani uh, Wind. And we, uh, this is basically uh, a backward integration okay. to ensure secure, uh, by sec for securitizing our supply chain. Mm. Because the speed at which uh, now the capacity addition in India has to happen. It is very important to secure the supply chain. Hmm. So that is the reason for our own consumption with such kind of huge plants is what we are looking for. And same is the case for module manufacturing. Correct. We are exploring at the right time to go for that also for our own internal requirement. Green hydrogen, yes. Uh, right now we have signed a, a, a PPA with our group company. Uh, steel which is looking for a green hydrogen uh, uh, supply. Uh, basically, it's a pilot case, mm -hmm. 25 okay. megawatts supplying 3,800 uh, uh, tons of uh, hydrogen and uh, uh, along with that 30,000 tons of uh, green oxygen also. Oh. So this is a pilot case because 
if you see the economics of at the present cost levels uh, is, is still uh, slightly away. But this as a learning, both from the user point of view, our steel, JSW steel, and from our uh, point of view to set up this, mm. we are already starting the work now mm. to supply this. So these are the areas where we are focusing in terms of to be future ready. As I said, mm. we need to be future ready to provide the best solution. Yeah, so if I may, sorry, if I may just summarize what, what Sharad has said, especially in the context of your question, you know, we are probably the most diversified energy platform in the country, spanning across all four modes of generation, both modes of storage, backward integration into equipment for supply chain de-risking, and forward integration from the electrons to molecules business. So what this gives is that it creates an opportunity set because periodically from time to time, you know, based on the competitive intensity and the complexity of solution, uh, the returns profile of any individual bucket may change. So it gives you the opportunity to switch across multiple buckets to maximize the underlying cash returns at any point of time. So I would say it's a very strong advantage rather than, you know, putting all your eggs in the same basket and, and being exposed to the risks of that particular basket. Okay, so clearly you have your task cut out for the next uh, 10 years at least. Thank you, gentlemen, for making time and speaking with ET now. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.